Today we're going to talk about what the Bible calls your heart. In English, anyway, when we say the heart, we think of emotions and feelings. But in the Bible, when it talks about the heart, it's more than that. It includes emotions and feelings, but it also in the Bible includes our deepest inward moral and spiritual convictions. The heart is the center of our moral and spiritual life in the Bible, especially in relationship to God. So it's talking about what is deep within us, and especially how that inward part of us relates to God. I'm using the English Standard Version. It says, keep your heart with all vigilance. Other versions say something like this. The NIV says, guard your heart. The New American Standard says, watch over your heart. The New King James says, keep your heart. In all of these cases, the idea is one of caring for, protecting, and guarding your heart. The context in Proverbs 4, the context is the advice from a father to a son. And so Proverbs 4.1 says, Hear, O sons, a father's instruction. And then Proverbs 4.20, My son, be attentive to my words. Now, I have to say to you that after... 31 or 32 years, let's see, 30, 32 years of seminary teaching, teaching students year after year, I have seen this verse prove remarkably true in one after another of the lives of the students I have taught. Because this verse says that the condition, the inward condition of our moral and spiritual character in relation to God really will determine the future of our life and ministry. This verse says that the nature, the status, the condition of your heart determines whether your life will go on to blessing and fruitful results to advance the work of God's kingdom, or sadly, in some cases, I have seen lives go on to be destroyed, destroyed families, destroyed marriages, and churches that were deeply harmed, and ministries that were deeply damaged because of the condition of a person's heart. Proverbs 4.23 says that is what will determine the course of your life, your ministry, and your effect on others. So I want to look at three things about Proverbs 4.23. What does it mean to keep your heart? Why should you keep your heart? And how can you keep your heart? The, uh, the Hebrew word translated keep means watch over, protect, guard. These translations are all getting at a similar idea. But it's modified by the phrase with all vigilance. With all vigilance. Now, literally, the Hebrew text says, more than all guarding, guard your heart or keep your heart, more than all guarding. And um, most translations say with all vigilance, with all diligence, with all carefulness. But if we think what is meant literally by more than all guarding, then we can compare this to other things that we guard in our lives. You go out of the room of this hotel, and what do you do? You check the door to see that it locks, to guard your things that you left in the room. If you walk away from your car in a shopping area, you lock the car to see that no one takes what is in it. You guard your checkbook or your bank account, to see that others don't have access to the PIN number and take money out of the ATM machine from your account. You guard it, you protect it. But this verse is saying, more than you guard those things, keep your heart. If you have children, or perhaps some of you even, grandchildren, and you're caring for them, 
you guard them, you protect them. But this verse says, more than that, keep your heart. More than all guarding. Perhaps you guard or protect your ministry or your job responsibility. But more than that, guard, keep your heart. Perhaps you exercise and you try to eat your vegetables and protect your health, you guard your health. But more than that, this verse is saying, keep your heart. Have you been doing that? Have you been making the condition of your heart a more important concern than anything else in your life? In practical terms, this means that from time to time, we might have to neglect or give less attention to some other good things. And these things are good, but it might mean that you have to give less attention to your family in order to keep your heart. Maybe you have to give less attention to your job, or to a church meeting, or to a repair on your house, or something else. You have to perhaps neglect something else in order to keep your heart more than all guarding, or with all vigilance, to keep your heart. Now, it doesn't mean you should neglect those things completely, but sometimes in the schedule of days, there are choices that come up. And it says the first choice has to be keeping your heart and keeping it right before God. Now, if the verse says, keep it or guard it with all village vigilance, if you guard it, that means your heart is not evil. There's something in it that's good, that is to be guarded and protected. But wait, as soon as I say that, someone is going to say, doesn't the Bible say the heart is evil? Doesn't it say in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked? Who can understand it? Yes, it does say that. But I do not think that is true of the heart of a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. And the reason I don't think it's true that your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked if you are a born-again Christian is that is not the way the New Testament talks about the heart of a New Testament Christian. Listen to some verses. Romans 5.5 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Romans 6, 17, thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Romans or Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near, that means draw near to God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. 1 John 3, 21, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God, whatever we ask. And so, as Christians, our hearts have been changed. There's a goodness to them that needs to be protected and guarded. But our hearts are not perfect. There was a book a few years ago that said, just follow your heart. And I think that advice neglects the other part of the teaching of the New Testament that sometimes our hearts can go astray, even as believers. James 3.14, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast and be false to the truth. James 4.8, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's why Proverbs 4.23 warns us, keep your heart with all vigilance, because your heart can go astray. Now, in the 1600s in England, there was a Puritan writer named John Flavel, F-L-A-V-E-L, Flavel or Flavel. And um, being a good Puritan, he decided when he wrote about this verse, that he would write 100 pages of commentary, and he did. I've read not all of it, but I've read some of it, and it's very helpful. But in that, Flavel says, our hearts are like a musical instrument 
you tune it and it's exactly right, and then you hang it on a wall, and a few days later you come by and it's out of tune. Or you tune it and then you bump it, and you bump it and it goes out of tune again. So our hearts can go astray. I thought that was a good analogy. Every once in a while, something or someone bumps into us. Doesn't that happen? And our hearts can get anxiety in them. Oh, it happens so often when we travel. Traffic jam, flat tire, train is late, aircraft is delayed, and there's a test for our hearts when the bump comes in. Or someone cuts in front of you in traffic or in the shopping line and there's a test for your heart. And if we neglect our hearts, they can go astray. So I saw this, who's Cambridge? You're Cambridge. I saw this in Cambridge one time a few years ago. We were working in Cambridge at Tyndall House for the ESV Bible Translation Committee. And then we were staying at the Gonville Hotel, just on Jesus Green. And our meetings were very intense from nine in the morning till five, but it was the most demanding work I have ever done in my life, academically, but attention-wise, because we would go through Matthew 12, Matthew 13, Matthew 14, and there, were, there was a list of verses we were, and proposed changes we were going to consider. And let's say that you had something that you wanted to say about a proposed change to Matthew 14, but you stepped out of the room for a minute or two. When you came back, they already finished Matthew 14. It's done. It's in the Bible. Sorry, you missed. <laughs> you can't doze at all. And uh, there was a process for getting reconsideration of something that was passed, but it required a two-thirds vote, and it was a great effort. So, Oh, you couldn't flag for a moment in your attention. And at 5 o'clock when we ended, or maybe 5.15, we were exhausted. We get back to the hotel, and they had to have a different kind of cutlery or silverware for the soup, and then a different kind for the salad, and then a different kind for the main course. And I mean, it was very British. It was elegant. But it took two and one half hours to eat dinner, and we're so tired. And then we get back to the room, and then there's some email to do, and I want to talk with Margaret a little bit, spend time with my wife. And I was getting to bed later and later and getting up earlier. And after a while, I just decided, you know, I'm going to set my alarm clock a half hour later. Why do I need to get up and spend time personally reading the Bible in the morning by myself and praying? Because I'm spending eight hours a day with 11 other Bible scholars looking at the Hebrew and Greek text of the Bible and talking about verses, I'm getting the most intense Bible study I've ever had in my life. So I set the alarm clock later. No personal prayer time. Day one, day two, day three. About day three or day four, Margaret began to notice something's wrong. And all of a sudden it hit me. I hadn't been keeping my heart. But I made a note that I carry around with me to look at from time to time. Results of missing my private prayer and Bible reading time. Pride. Talking about myself a lot. Often inwardly hoping people will praise me. Lack of love for friends. Irritability. Relationships with friends just stall. They're put on hold. General inward feeling of unease and unsettledness. Hard to concentrate on scripture and prayer. Self-reliance. No peace. And I had to say to Margaret, I'm sorry. I realized something has gone wrong. And I had to confess it to the Lord and ask his forgiveness and set the alarm clock earlier. And then the next morning when the committee met, I asked if I could have a minute at the beginning to say, I'm sorry for my attitude the last day or two or three. And this is what happened. I don't know if it's happened to you. If you don't keep your heart, 
goes astray. So that's what it means to keep your heart. Give attention to the inward condition of your moral and spiritual life, especially in relationship to God. Why? Why should you keep your heart? The verse says, For from it flow the springs of life. Once again, the Hebrew expression is not so easy to translate into understandable English. If I sort of did the words just literally, it would say, for from it, from your heart, are the outgoings of life. The Hebrew word totsaoth is a plural form. It's related to the verb yatsa. If you've studied Hebrew, it's a very common word to go out, to go out of a door, to go out of a out of some place or another, out of a city. And this is the, that's a noun form, means the goings out. For from it are the goings out of life. And most translators have said the image that the author wants us to see is a spring or a river coming out of our heart, as if the condition of our heart is a stream of water flowing out continually to impact people around us. And so most translations say, for from it flow the springs of life or something similar to that. I think, I think Jesus had this verse in mind in Luke 6, 45, where he said, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. You're driving or riding your bicycle, and someone cuts you off in traffic, and you open your mouth to bless <laughs> or to curse. Your life is flowing out of your mouth to impact others. Jesus also said, in a similar vein, in Mark 7, 21, for from within, from out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within. So we ask, why do people do evil things? Just when, within the last few weeks, a, a sad headline in the United States. Pastor of 15,000 member church in Indiana is caught in sexual immorality with a teenage girl. Now why? Or the head of our CIA, David Petraeus, caught in an immoral affair with another woman. Why? It didn't happen just in an instant. Something went wrong long before in his heart. There was all of a sudden an attraction to this other person, to this woman, an attraction that should only be directed toward his wife, and he should have recognized it and gotten out of the situation immediately while it was still just an attraction in his heart. But he let his heart go astray, and great damage came from it. For from within, says Jesus, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit. Now when I start reading that, I have to say, if I'm honest, I recognize that the beginnings of many of those thoughts come from time to time in the course of my life. I see my heart starting to produce evil thoughts. I, I don't know if you can identify with that, but I, I think if you're honest, you, you all of a sudden in the middle of the day say, where did that thought come from? That's wrong, that's evil, that's immoral. But sometimes those thoughts pop into our minds, our hearts. So do you see why the Bible tells us to keep our hearts 
more than all guarding, with all vigilance, more than everything else. Every time you encounter a new situation, out of your heart flows the outgoing of your life. What's in your heart is constantly flowing out like a life spring to impact others. And the quality of your inward moral and spiritual life is constantly impacting others for good or for ill. From time to time, Margaret and I have had friends, and we love to be with them because their hearts are full of love for Jesus and full of faith. And every time we're with them, our own faith is built up, and the spirit of thanksgiving just overwhelms us. That's what flows out from them because of what's in their heart. Many of you here at European Leadership Forum, many of you, probably all of you, have some kind of responsibility in your church or in your ministry of one sort or another. You may lead a Bible study. You may be leading a home fellowship group. You may be leading other kinds of ministry activity. You may be counseling others. Certainly you all have friends that you come in contact with. In all of these activities, and especially in these ministry activities, if our heart is full of self and pride, the interpretation of the Bible that we teach in our Bible study might be perfect. Our doctrine might be sound, but self and pride will also be what we communicate. And it becomes like a virus to flow out and touch others. If our hearts are full of fear, then fear will flow out of us like a virus to impact others. Or anger and bitterness will also flow out from us to contact others. But if our hearts are full of love for Jesus and faith in Him, love for Jesus and faith will be the spring that flows out from our hearts and refreshes all who hear. Now many of you, if you are involved in ministries as I am, you're concerned what's going to happen in the next decade? What's going to happen in the next generation? Will our church abandon belief in the Bible? Will it stray over into radical theological liberalism and deny the miracles of the Bible and deny the truth of this and that passage and deny salvation by faith alone and the central doctrines of the Christian faith? And you look around and you see other churches and other ministries that have gone astray over the years and you wonder, why? What has happened? What caused this straying from the truth? I found an interesting analysis in the writings of Charles Hodge a long time ago. Charles Hodge, I'll just wait a minute on that. Hodge was a professor at Princeton Seminary in New Jersey from 1820 to 1878 do the math. That's 58 years he was a professor. He started out teaching Oriental and Biblical literature, that is Hebrew mostly, other Oriental languages, and then he shifted to teach systematic theology. And remember that Princeton, from the time of its founding in 1809 until more liberal factions took over the control of the board in 1929, for 120 years, Princeton Seminary was the center of biblical Orthodox Christianity in the United States. And uh, anybody who taught at Princeton in those days could easily have come and taught at European Leadership Forum and the, gov the, the uh, steering committee or the, the uh, board would have said, wow, we're so thankful for this sound Bible teacher coming. So uh, Princeton was a great place. It influenced generation after generation of pastors and missionaries around the world. But Charles Hodge, he came there in 1820. And by 1826, he said, why is all this theological liberalism 
this denial of scripture. Why is it coming from Germany? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know how many Germans we have here, but you're not responsible. Okay. So he decided to take two years. He traveled to Germany and he, he studied there in the lecture halls of these influential liberal professors for two years, 1826 to 1828. And when he came back, he spoke to Princeton Seminary students on this verse, Proverbs 4.23, in attempting to answer the question of why theological liberalism had overtaken the churches in Germany. And this is what he said. Holiness is essential to the correct knowledge of divine things and the great security from error. Wherever you find vital piety, by vital piety, we would say today um, a sound personal relationship day by day with Jesus, a sound prayer life and personal reading of the Bible, personal devotional life. We'd maybe use other terms, but vital piety is what he meant. Wherever you find vital piety, there you find the doctrines of the fall, of depravity, of regeneration, of atonement, and of the deity of Jesus Christ. Hodge then exhorted seminary students, keep your hearts with all diligence, for out of them are the issues of life. Holiness is essential to correct knowledge of divine things and the great security from error. And then he said, when men lose the life of religion, they can believe the most monstrous doctrines and glory in them. Hodge said the reason why in the former great centers of Protestantism, especially Germany, the birthplace of the Reformation, the reason why Christianity had ceased to be even the nominal religion was the decline of vital religion or a lack of care for the spiritual character of one's own heart. Even today and throughout history, I believe that God allows some seemingly attractive wrong teaching to prosper in the church and to gain a following to test our hearts, to see whether we will be true to him and follow his word or follow this or that erroneous teaching which is gaining a following at the moment. So the first reason to keep our hearts then is for from it flow the springs of life. I'm going to take a detour for a minute I'm going to move away from this verse and just say, if we look through the whole Bible, does it say anything about the importance of our hearts? Well, I think it does. You see, God put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden very at the very first to see whether their hearts would be true to him or follow the attractive, persuasive temptation of the serpent who distorted God's words and lied. And after all, the fruit was a delight to the eyes. And it was good for food, and it was to be desired to make one wise. It looked so attractive. Would Eve be true and faithful to God, or follow the attractive alternative that was presented to her in the world? And then Adam, too, fell away. So their hearts were not true to God. Then, by Genesis 6, it says in Genesis 6, 5, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so God brought a flood on the earth. And the rest of the Old Testament, you could say, is God calling a people to himself, yes, but then searching for a man after his own heart who would lead God's people. He raised up Saul as king, but then through the prophet Samuel, God said to Saul, your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And so God raised up David, who was for a time a man after God's own heart. But then even David himself strayed in his sin with Bathsheba. His heart went astray. And he cried out in repentance in Psalm 51, 
Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And then God raised up Solomon after David died. But 1 Kings 11.4 tells us, When Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully true to the, whole, to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. And so, through a prophet Asa, God could say, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. The Old Testament looked forward, looked forward in hope to the coming of a Messiah and a new covenant when God would write his laws on people's hearts. When the New Testament came, Jesus then at last is truly a man after God's own heart. And he's purer in heart than David. He's wiser than Solomon. Jesus is the one in whom the Father delights. And for those of us who have trusted in Christ, the Holy Spirit has already cleansed our hearts, but they're not completely pure. One day, when Jesus returns, then we shall be like him. First John says, when he appears, we shall be like him. One day our hearts will be perfectly pure and we will know the favor of God resting on us forever. So you could see the whole Bible, in a sense, as many examples of God testing the hearts of his people. So still today, God tests our hearts. I mean, we think of the Apostle Paul as uh, a great model of a leader in Christian ministry, but Paul could say in 1 Thessalonians 2.4, just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. To please God who tests our hearts. Paul knew that day by day, God was testing his heart as he ministered. I hear pages rattling. Are your outlines not syncing with my, or are, they, are you following? You're okay? All right. It's just the teacher in me. I'm sorry. Okay. And so today, I, I think this verse is still true. I think it still applies. I think it still applies to this room, room 45, in the hotel whose name I don't know how to pronounce. <laughs> I think it's true this afternoon. 2 Chronicles 16.9 The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, but even through this room to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. So the first reason we should keep our hearts with all vigilance is that from them flow the springs of life. The second reason is that the whole Bible bears witness to the fact that the condition of people's hearts is very important to God. And as I said, I think God will let different tests come into your life to test your heart. The former president of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, where I taught, Ken Meyer, he, he would tell a story about the time when he was a pastor. And Many times he would eat breakfast at the same restaurant because it was a good place to meet people and talk. And so he got to know the manager of the restaurant. One day he went into the restaurant, he paid his bill, and he walked out, and he was putting his money back in his wallet, and he noticed he had $5 too much. He walked back in the restaurant and gave the $5 back to the manager, and he said, you gave me too much change. And she said, I was just testing you, Pastor. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? It's humorous, but it's kind of an example, I think, how God lets different things happen in our life. And um, uh, do you know? Do you know how this happens? Are you recognizing that it come, the situations come up? Um, um, 
over the last week we were at a different event for a, another Christian group and um, there was some there was a time when the bus was supposed to come and pick up our group and it wasn't there at 3 and it wasn't there at 3.15 and it wasn't there at 3.30 and, and we got back through the day and I said to Margaret, do you think we did okay? Was our heart still trusting in the Lord as we were waiting and waiting in the hot sun? It was, it was in Istanbul and it was hot. Don't those things happen to us? And God lets those happen every once in a while. And if we fail in terms of our heart, then we need to ask forgiveness from those to whom we've spoken harshly. And we need to ask God's forgiveness. Lord, cleanse my heart and help me to do better next time. It happens. Sometimes it's bigger things. I had a student who went from the seminary where I was teaching on to PhD work. He was finishing his PhD and one job opening came along. He'd been through all this schooling, one job opening. He interviewed they liked him. He was the only candidate. They said, here, here's an offer for this, this teaching position. If you will just change your viewpoint on this one point, because we don't want to really, well, we just would like you to change your viewpoint on this one thing. And he said, no, I'm sorry. It's what the Bible teaches. I can't change. So they said, sorry, we cannot hire you. He didn't have a job. He didn't have any income. They went back to the drawing board. They didn't have another candidate. And I met him at that point, and his life was totally uncertain. And I said to him, you know, I think God sees this, and he's pleased. I think God is pleased. I think he'll be faithful to you, and he'll care for you. And what happened? He got a two-year teaching position in the University of Cambridge, which didn't hurt at all for his future. And then he got another teaching position at a very, 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 I don't know what to say, high influence uh, seminary. And God took care of him. But I think there was a heart test that involved his whole future. And he was faithful. For you, what will it be? Some friends might turn against you. It might be illness, it might be a financial setback. If you have a family, it might be difficulties with children or with your parents or with, with your wife's parents <laughs> or your husband's parents if you're married. Could be temptation to do wrong for the sake of great gain or a thousand other things, but God is watching. He's asking, will you continue to trust me? Will you not give in to the temptation to become bitter or resentful? Will you keep your heart with all vigilance? So we talked about what it is to keep your heart. We talked about why you should keep your heart. Now, the question is, how can you keep your heart? How to do it. You see, when the verse commands us, keep your heart with all vigilance, it, it implies that you can know what's in your heart. It implies that you can examine your heart. Else there'd be no sense in telling you to guard it or to keep it or protect it. What do you see in your heart? If you're nervous or tense, ask, what is it, Lord? What's troubling my heart? Will you make it right? If you're fearful or worried about the future, tell it to God. Lord, help me understand this fear. Help me to trust in you in my heart. And don't pollute your heart. If you know that there are movies or books or internet sites that pollute your heart, don't go there. Keep your heart with all vigilance. You know, I think one part of growth in Christian maturity is learning to know your own heart. To know what it feels like when your heart is not right before God. When you are arguing or pushing for something in a meeting 
in the strength of the flesh instead of in following the Lord. And I have done that in committee meetings. I have done that in faculty meetings from time to time where I'm continually trying to argue my point and make my point and then the Lord just says, Wayne, be quiet. Shut your mouth. <laughs> I can take care of this. Because in my heart it was feeling like I was just pushing for it in my own strength and it wasn't, it wasn't faith in the Lord to make it come out right. Know what it feels like. Learn to know what it feels like when the Holy Spirit convicts your heart. From time to time in conversation, I'll say something and I'll get almost a physical pain somewhere right in here. And, and I think it's, it, for me at least, it's, it's the Holy Spirit saying, Wayne, that wasn't right. That was slanderous or that, we would, that might not have been true. And I have to back up and say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Will you forgive me? That was wrong. But also we can learn, I think, to know what it feels like when the peace of God is guarding your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. To know what it feels like when your heart is in constant communion with God. And I think we can learn to stay in that place spiritually more and more. A lot of it, I think, just comes from taking quiet moments during the day and, and thinking, now, Lord, what's happening in my heart? Help me to understand. And then... Another great help is just the old-fashioned means of grace, the, the disciplines of the Christian life. Bible reading, prayer in private and in small groups, worship, and extended times of worship are wonderful in purifying our hearts. Obedience to the Word of God, caring for the needs of others, sharing Christ with those who don't know Him, fellowship with God's people, just the old-fashioned means of grace. So the question is, will you keep your heart with all vigilance today and this week and for your life? If you will, then I think Proverbs 4.23 says to us, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of life. If you will keep your heart I think from your heart will continually flow a life of blessing and a manifestation of the presence of God and God will look and he'll be pleased and his favor and his blessing and his delight will rest on you through all your days and your life will bring him glory more and more until the day he says, come home. Well done good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master.